and that urgently call for action. Gustave's concern with extinction has been underlining his entire life, along with the threat of climate change. In 1942, at 16, he was influenced by the writing of Edmond Bordeaux' Sekeli, a Hungarian philosophy, philo, philologist, linguist, philosopher, psychologist, and natural living enthusiast. Gustav considered for a moment to go and live in a community that it set up that Szeziski set up in Tecate in Barra, California, Mexico. Would this have eased the initial trauma as Christians were brilliantly discussed and exposed? We shall not know. But one of his actions was his lifelong commitment to vegetarianism. The question of extinction is of adamant urgency. As we discussed in the video conversation where we realized in Oxford, together with Joan Ravitz, about the Harmony Manifesto that Ravitz wrote and co-signed together with Robin Clark, Dick Dickinson, Peter Harbour, Kid Pedler, and, and Gustav in 1972, the prescience of their words and the understanding that a change of course was needed and that actions had to take place. The third point of the 1970, of the, sorry, it was 1970, not 1972, of the 1970 manifesto reads, three, for survival, we as a species must regain all attitudes and acquire new skills for our action for our interaction with the world around us. In the simplest term, our planet and its resources must be a heritage to be protected and improved for our descendants. Instead of consuming materials and energy, we must fit into sta stable cycles of transformation of energy and matter. The knowledge which enables such a harmony to be achieved with that millennia of prior experience can be gained by a natural science transformed for this function. Its new style will necessarily be of unity rather than fragmentation, of reverence for its material rather than cold contempt, of the synthesis of the natural, social, and spiritual aspects of a situation rather than, that, rather than their destructive separation. It will find its insight and inspiration not only from natural philosophers and creative engineers of our recent past, but from poets, prophets, and craftsmen, famous and nameless, for, from all cultures and he, all history. I would like to come back to the final part of Jonathan Benthol's presentation. Indeed, the doors were in tune with a word in mutation when they, were sang, when they sang in When's the Music Over, what have they done to the earth? What have they done to our fair sister? Ravaged and plundered and ripped her and beat her, stuck her with knives in the side of the dawn and tied her with fences and dragged her down. Let us return to Jonathan's question. What are our moral resources to prevent mass extinction? And I take your point, Christine, of course, with the problematic of the moral point. However, let me dwell slightly longer. So the question could be raised as to whether some essentially unpredictable kind of transhumanism equips us better than the traditional values to save off mass extinction. The showing of the clip of Silent Barrage by Guy Ben Ari introduced a discussion about the ethical ambiguities that it represents. Benthol would contend that natural science as such provides no basis for a system of morality, and we have not yet generated adequate substitutes for morality based on religions, whatever the damaging influence in history. These debates become urgent as we face the threat of extinction. The Silent Barrage piece seems to be doing just that too raising awareness. My only caveat though, if any, would be that the biotechnological art form that seems to be at the root of the piece may also be part of the problem. It shows many limits too, and it, as it raises many concerns and potential problems that Gustav warned us again, namely the social responsibility of artists when, meld when melding with life forms, and for this hybrid creation to control mechanical tools and thus possibly weapons. A recent headline in the, from The Guardian read, ex-Google worker fears killer robots could cause mass atrocities, an article that Gustav, I am sure, would have kept. The post-humanism represented by Guy Benari and hinted in Gustav's radical yet poetical art embodies the hope that we strive for. To quote artist and activist Ben Moria, who contributed to the poster exhibition in writing, and I will, that will be his emphasis, as you will see outside, the need for art to change the world, or more importantly, the need for art to inspire humanity itself to see the change needed. 
The exhibition of poster was realized in inviting artists Ursula Biermann, Graciela Carnevale, Cecilia Cavalieri, Ira Davis, Svetlana Heger, Karl Anquist, Frank Lebovici, Lilian Lin, Gustav Metzger, Ben Maria, Fionn Niblock, Karen Sender, Ben Vautier, and Jacques Villegle, to each wrote the sentence that gave the symposium its title, The Need for Art to Change the World. Please do allow me to read in full the quotation that Metzger wrote in 1993 in outline for a retrospective 1959-1974, a manuscript in which Gustave was drawing up his ideal retrospective that we found as in the making of the book, and that, strongly, and that resonates strongly now more than ever. So the, I'll invite you to read the text in full, but let me jump into the two paragraphs concerned. Something else led to tensions and misunderstandings, both with artists and art organizers. That was my determination to stay out of commercial art galleries. There were occasions when I was tempted to join a venture, but the risk of handling in some galleries, of, beg your pardon, but the risk of lending in some gallery as a result would keep me from joining from the outset. A further difficulty will have been my insistence on the need to challenge and change the world, the need for art to change the world. This met with resistance from artists and with considerable opposition by the art establishment, whose most effective form of response was to completely ignore my existence and write me out of the record. As I was preparing our symposium and exhibition and during the, our conversation here in Zurich, backstage we kept on referring to Gaia, the hypothesis first formulated by James Lovelock, a scientist, environmentalist, and futurist, not that first formulated in 1972 and followed by popularizing a book in 1979 entitled A New Look at Life on Earth. Our researches <clears throat> were greatly informed by Bruno Latour's work and especially Facing Gaia, eight lectures on the new climatic regime. Isabel Stenger, whose own call in catastrophic time, times, resisting the coming barbarism could hardly be more fitting to our concerns. And Eduardo Vivero de Castro and Deborah Danowski's fundamental publication, The Ends of the World. Invited to contribute to the present symposium, Deborah wrote back, that in fact we are living in the inch and the issue of extinction is in the center. The symposium on Gustav Metzger seems to me in many ways fundamental. I'm not disagree with her. Artist Cecilia Cavalieri contributed to the poster exhibition with two exceptional pieces. In perfect echo to that of Ursula Biermann asking us to have a black poster made with the letters cut out and an image of the burning Amazon fire shining through from the background, Cavalieri also addressed the pressing challenges of our time in telling us that it is already necrosen in Brazil. Cavalieri's second contribution also takes us on a necessary journey that is the way forward. In, the, in literally testing one of the ecofeminism hypotheses in an extract from Flammarion publication La Nature, Cecilia substituted all occurrences of the word nature to that of femme and all the possible variations. The title of the piece being, Art is not going to save us from ourselves. But let us return to the quote itself, the need for art to change the world. When invited to contribute a poster, artist Stuart Brisley and fellow camarade of Gustave in the iconic exhibition, Three Life Situations at Gallery House, 1972, Stuart declined to take part in the exhibition in writing, I won't be writing however, with the word to express the need for art to change the world. Change is a loose term. It could mean a number of things. No, end of quote. And, it, and indeed, it can. I propose to seize the great strength that polysemy offers and indeed rely on the great need for change. Ben Vautier, reflecting upon Gustave's statements, wrote back to us, uh, I'm sorry. The need for art to change the world. Although I could have believed in such a text a few years ago, I cannot believe it anymore. But never mind. No, but never mind. Let's play the game. With dabs, you will understand later. As usual, your sub I'm sorry, that's as usual, your subject goes straight to the point. If you read my newsletter, I became more and more pessimistic about the mention culture. It all depends on what is meant by art. If art comes down to a suite of products exhibited in museums, I do not think it will change the world. 
On the other hand, if art is to ask questions on the limits of art, etc., etc., so why not? By dint of searching for newness, an artist will discover maybe the non-ego, the anti-ego. Metzger may have tried. When you speak of progress for me, it is the ego which, seeking new things, advances in time. Time is important. It will allow the ego to exhaust the already done, le déjà fait, to arrive at a non-art and to solve the problem of the ego. To change, but how to change? Ivor Davis graced, graced, graced us with so much in these past few days, also contributed with a magnificent poster that rightfully addressed the necessity for plurality in calling for the need for an art to change the world. Finally, I would like to refer to Karen Sander who wrote, I thought you have to do an own statement or sentence so the artist is present during the symposium through all of his work. And thus, please do allow me to finally wrap up the symposium in reading one of the last published texts by Gustav. So I'm sorry, Andrew, you stole my uh, limelight, but nonetheless, we go back to that fundamental text, I'm afraid, which was the statement written in June 2013 for the conference facing extinction at the University for the Creative Arts, Farnham, 7th and 8th of June 2014. Let us repeat it nonetheless. I think it is important it doesn't take long, and sometimes it's better to repeat than not to have read at all. The art, architecture, and design world needs to take a stand against the ongoing erasure of spices, even when there is little chance of ultimate success. It is front of the struggle. Humanity has moved through extreme crises in the past. Time and speed is of the essence. There is no choice but to follow the path of ethics into aesthetics. We envisage artists, academics, ecologists, art historians, architects, critics, curators, economists, and writers being involved. Without nature, there, can be, there cannot be art, Durer said in his much quoted sentence. And verily, art resides in nature. He who can tear it out has it. We live in societies suffocating in waste. Every time you consider buying a new laptop or mobile phone, you need to recall the agonizing photographs of young men, prematurely aged, who spend their shortened lives dealing with the toxic technology discarded by our civilization. The cycle of extinction starts with the plastic milk bottles left on the doorstep of the newly built suburban houses and reaches its destructive climax in the deep forest of other continents. The daisy is light, joyful, vulnerable, a favorite of children. Daisy chains is a term used to describe connections and exchanges between group of peoples. In computing, daisy chain refers to multiple linkage of electronic devices. In our struggle against max extinction, the daisy will become a widely used symbol. And as for conclusion, some of Gustav's final published words, following the path so clearly laid out by Gustav, our aim now is to create mass movement toward of extinction. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. I much appreciate. I also thank, of course, Vetlana, everyone, the whole department, Ethel Meinheit, who can only be here for one night, but whose contribution was essential. That discussion, Norman, Kriver, Christine, Catherine, Andrew, and Laura, of course. Well, of course, I'm going to thank myself last. And me. <laughs> no. And Gustav. For Gustav. <laughs> thank you.